I want to talk to you all today about a host of people who inspire me. And these individuals might not even know who they are right now, but they're about to embark on a pathway that's going to change our lives, our children's lives, and all future generations. And these are, uh, they're about to enter the biomedical workforce, or as I like to call it, the biomedical research ecosystem. So what is an ecosystem? An eco ecosystem is simply a complex set of communities that work together and function as, as one unit. And so the biomedical research uh, workforce and or ecosystem works across individuals, works across institutions, across uh, states, across the nation, and across the world to improve our lives and to propel science forward. So I work for the National Institutes of Health, and we are seeing great advances in biomedical sciences that are allowing Americans to live longer and healthier lives. Now, I am a beneficiary of this magnificent research. And one of the reasons that I wanted to join NIH and join its mission was because I am a cancer survivor. For me, um, because I am a cancer survivor, uh, the research that went before led to a number of different types of therapies that I could use to combat that cancer. Cancer rates and uh, the diagnosis and deaths from cancers is down, is fallen significantly. We see that cancer rates are falling about 1% a year. Our cardiovascular diseases are down 60% in the last half century. And a young adult who now has HIV has the ability to have a productive life until they're in their 60s or 70s. And the last thing we should remember that if we were around in 1900, our life expectancy was about to the age of 47. But look where we've come today. We now have a life expectancy in this country of almost to the age of 80. That is absolutely incredible. And think what that has done for we as Americans and we living in the United States and for our economy and all other aspects of our, of our society. But how have we gotten to this point? We have gotten there because of the dedicated scientists and researchers who are world leaders in discovery and innovation. They are, are conducting basic science where they're trying to learn how things work and uh, adding to our knowledge base. They're conducting clinical and translational science which, which take these basic sciences and apply them to practical um, outcomes so to improve our health. And like all great teams, we have to think about seeding those teams with new recruits, right? We want that next generation to be just as strong so they are contributing to improving our health as quickly as the current cadre of, of investigators and those that came before it. So as part of our mission, and also the mission across the whole biomedical ecosystem, is to assure that our trainees are getting the gr best training possible, that they're choosing careers in biomedical research, and that they're going to be successful at that career. So because this is so important to us, we um, always pay a lot of attention to trainees but we began hearing some worrisome trends. For example, we recognized that the length of time it takes to get through that training period was really, really extending. We also saw that and heard that many people were reconsidering their plans to go on to a research career. And we also um, knew that uh, a number of individuals were telling us that there's this just, just sense of disquiet in graduate students in particular about their chances to have successful careers in science. I look back at when I got a PhD, which was back in the 80s when I was quite a bit thinner and had a big hair, uh, like many of us, and I got a degree in my 20s and was out onto my job um, quite rapidly, as were most of my colleagues. But today, things are much different. So we knew things were changing, and we knew we had to study this ecosystem as a research problem. So our, our director, uh, Dr. Francis Collins, who many of you know, um, charged a committee to take a look at the, the ecosystem and to model it and to make some recommendations of how we could uh, make it stronger. And I want to tell you about the results of this study because it's been very fascinating. And while it's, it's, um, uh, it's the world in which we live in today, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the world that we'll live in tomorrow. But it's important for those that are coming up in the ranks to understand that there's challenges that accompany um, the great opportunities in science. 
what path are you going to take? Most individuals who are investigators and scientists in biomedical research receive PhDs. And about 70% of our workforce are PhDs. The other portion of our workforce are, are very importantly MDs, MD-PhD combo degrees, other clinicians such as veterinarians, dentists, nurses, others that all form this ecosystem. Our study concentrated on the PhD because it was the largest. So what's happening to you when you get a PhD? Um, the first thing that happens is you're going to spend about six to seven years getting a PhD, which puts you at the age of about 31 when you receive your PhD in a biomedical related area. Now this is, shows again how things have changed and I said, hmm, even I can do elementary math and when I was a kid, I undergraduate degree at the age of 22, if you add six or seven years to that, why aren't people getting degrees at 28 and 29? Well, any of you that are undergraduates here and or parents of undergraduates know that many undergraduates on the, are on the five, six, seven year plan. Some undergraduates take time off for an adventure uh, between the time they, they, leave, they get their degree and go on to graduate school. And still others are actually um, collecting some research experience before going on. So that now puts us about in the, the mid to late 20s before you even embark on graduate school. Then what happens to individuals? Well, the next step for most individuals is the postdoc. 73% of all of our PhDs in this country go on for a postdoc or postdoctoral fellowship. This is a time when you work in an established investigator's laboratory. You are honing skills. You are taking some of your novel ideas and running with them. And your salary is going to be paid off grants generally that NIH gives, the grants to the investigator within whose laboratory you work. So what is happening here is that it's taking five to six years to get through that postdoctoral training period. And this was what the surprise and the big change was. So this puts individuals at the age of about 37 before they're really launching their independent research career. We, we have to question why is this happening? And this is a chart that just shows you the distribution of the age of our investigators at NIH that we support in 1980. So on average, people were about the age of 37 uh, that were on NIH grants. And I just want to play this movie for you if it will go. Unfortunately, we're not seeing the movie. Okay, we tried it backstage at work. But let me just tell you the outcome. If you could see this movie, you would see a rapid, a re not rapid, but over the 30-year period, a very long extension of the time in the aging of the workforce till today our average investigators are about 53 as opposed to 37. So what does this mean? It means that investigators are working much later into their lives and having productive careers much later. And it also means that there's much less turnover. So if you're at the beginning of this, if you're in your 30s trying to break in, you'll see that there is positions, particularly in academic institutions, aren't opening up. The other thing is very concerning when you think about all of us and we talk about creativity, which is so essential for science. We would love to have people who are probably in their most creative period in their 30s being able to have independent careers so they can run after those great discoveries. So for all these reasons, we felt that we need to really make some changes so that um, the uh, length of time that individuals sp spend in training as well as um, they, where they're going to go um, is, is uh, looked at and taken care of. So that was the next question. Are we really having some sort of employment crisis? So we had to go back and look at where people end up. Now most of us that are in graduate school think about academic careers, right? You're going to go on and have an academic career. You're going to do research and teach. And that's what we call being at the bench. They're going to do laboratory science. And most of us aspire to that. But what we discovered through the course of the study was that while still the largest component of our research is that end up in academia, many others act, end up in other places and beyond the bench. So this term, beyond the bench, uh, what does it mean? Well, I'm a great example of a beyond the bencher. I, I invented a new word um, here because I have had a career that has taken all sorts of, of twists and turns and have not uh, not conducted bench science since I, I finished my postdoc. So let me just tell you a little bit about my background. I am an entomologist, PhD entomologist. I'm here to bug you. Laugh hard. 
You're supposed to laugh at TED Talks, it's about as humorous as I get here. Um, so I'm an entomologist, but I am over a grants program in biomedical research, first and for a, a very odd combination. I am not an academia, I am a government employee. Some would call me a government bureaucrat. I actually call myself a government bureaucrat. I sort of use it as a loving term <laughs> until I looked it up one day. I looked it up in the dictionary and it said a bureaucrat, an individual in a bureaucracy. Now how bureaucratic is that? And then it said to my horror, um, one who is only interested in petty forms and proper rules. So I want to tell you all, I am not that bureaucrat. I am your public servant. That's what I am. So what is it that I do? I'm, a res I'm in research administration, and research administration basically is the way we design the apparatus to make sure that the research enterprise can be as efficient and as effective as possible. That's really what it's all about. So you may do a job like mine, you may be managing, a pro you may be a program op officer managing programs, you might be a scientist that's overseeing review, uh, you might be working on intellectual property, all sorts of things that you might be doing. So let's get back to the model and just look at what our results found out. First, there's great news that those that get PhDs in this country have very little unemployment, only about a 2% unemployment, fantastic. Secondly, about 14% of our PhDs will get out of research or research-related careers entirely, but not necessarily out of science. So if you go off and become a science teacher, a high school science teacher, you would be in this box. Doesn't mean that you're not still involved with science, but you're not involved with research. Um, you may, in fact, become a journalist, or you may become a member of Congress. We have them. We have scientists in Congress. Um, so it's fantastic to think about people with um, knowledge about science being in every sector of our society. That is truly fantastic. But for this endeavor, we were really interested in those that are going to stay in research and research-related areas. So let's take a look at that. Um, first of all, as I said, about 45% end up in academia. Now this is what really surprised us, because even if you end up in academia at a university, only about half of you are going to be in that traditional role that we think of as a professor conducting research. The, uh, the other half, you might be conducting research, but you're on soft money. So you're not in a tenured or tenure track position. You, um, soft money means that you're responsible for bringing in your salary off grants. Uh, you might be teaching or you might be doing some combo of each of those. 5% do bench science for the government. So NIH has an enormous intramural program, we call it, which is government scientists that are pursuing really phenomenal research. So there's other agencies as well that have, um, have this kind of uh, intramural program. About 16% are doing bench science and in industry. And so that means that they're working for a pharmaceutical company or a biotech company, and they're developing devices and therapeutics and drug discovery, all of which is probably predicated on the research and basic science research that was done by the universities and the government. And then finally, the rest are in where I am, which is in the research-related area. So about 17% of us are in research-related areas. So we recognize that with the, the majority of all of our PhDs going somewhere else, that we had to think about how we're training people. So we have done a lot of things to, to recognize this. First and foremost, we recommitted to saying, the thing that's going to make you most successful as a scientist is excellent scientific training. So you're gonna learn everything about conducting research in a laboratory, all the way from setting up experiments to publishing a result and taking that kernel of an idea and running with it. Very, very important. Secondly, one of the things that's important is that graduate students in particular, but also postdocs, need to recognize that they're going to go to this myriad of all these different careers now. And they need to learn about this early in their career so that they can get on the right trajectory and pick up those skills that they're going to need. And who's going to help them with this? It's going to be their advisors and their mentors. So we now require that anybody that has support from us at NIH um, actually has a discussion with their advisors and mentors to think about their career and where they might want to go. We've diversified our training programs, so now instead of just scientific training, you're also going to learn other skills, like you're going to maybe spend some time in industry. We see that 
a lot of young people now in science want to start their own businesses. We've heard about many of them uh, today. And so we want to give people entrepreneurial skills. We might have you work in a tech transfer office to understand how to take those technologies and commercialize them. Um, all of these things, and you might work actually in a, in a research, sponsored research office at your university, or you might work on policy, science policy, like what I work on. All of these things are going to better prepare you for um, the future. But really, when we think about uh, what we want to do here is to make this a job so attractive that instead of young people being worried about um, this, having a successful career, they're instead beating down our doors to get in. And the thing that makes it the most attractive is the discoveries that we make. So think about it, some of the things that have happened of late. We really, um, now what used to cost almost $400 million to sequence a human genome, now costs $1,000. That means that we can use your genome to tell, to help us um, describe and prescribe um, treatments that are very specific to your individuality. So that's very important. Secondly, we are studying the brain. You know, there's 86 billion neurons in the brain. Each one has a thousand connections. And we're really trying to understand all these connections and what they mean so that we can fight brain disorders like Alzheimer's and autism. And finally, as you know, um, we are right in the midst of this horrible and terrible out, um, outbreak of Ebola. So we have much to learn about infectious disease and we are currently working towards both treatments and vaccines for Ebola, but we're also working on the, the universal flu vaccine so that you, if you receive a vaccine for seasonal flu, it will protect you uh, against a variety of flus over a long period of time. So Francis Collins, my boss, said once in one of his TED Talks that this is the century for biology. It's also the century for health and innovation. And there's things that all, all of us can do. If you are dreaming about becoming a scientist, go for that dream. Absolutely go for that dream. Overcome any obstacles. If you're a mentor or advisor of a, of a student or postdoc, help them along their way. Get them in the right directions. Get them the skills they need to be successful. And finally, we want to know about experiences that, that um, trainees are having so we can help craft a new way of thinking about the program. Because this ecosystem and its vitality and its longevity and its sustainability are so important because um, we believe that from it will emerge the next superhero of science. So thank you very much.